I'm happy to announce Renault Lifschitz and his talk Android Geolocation Using the GSM Network. And the subtitle is Where Was Waldroid? I hope we're going to learn what this is, uh, yeah, what this is going to be. So um, I think we're, we're good to start. Renault. Thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to my talk. Uh, first of all, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm uh, Ono Lifschitz, coming from uh, Paris, France. I'm a computer security engineer. I do uh, mainly penetration testing, security trainings, and security research in my company. And um, my uh, main interests are uh, security of protocols. That means uh, authentication, cryptography, information leakage, zero knowledge protocols, and so on. And uh, another interest is uh, number theory. Uh, uh, number theory, uh, primality testing, factorization, and so on. So don't worry, there won't be any mass theorem or uh, complex proofs in, uh, in my talk. Don't bother with that. So first of all, why Android and not iPhone or Blackberry, for instance? Why not? In just two years, in fact, uh, Android uh, has uh, made uh, an, an impressive uh, uh, market share. Okay, so uh, for for now, uh, nearly 300,000 phones are activated each day, according to uh, to Google. Andy Rubin, who is the the director for the the Android uh, part of uh, uh, Google activity. And now uh, Android sales uh, overtake iPhone since summer. So uh, Android is now a big uh, part uh, of the, the phone nowadays. And uh, the last point is because hacking with Android is very cool. You have uh, a true a real uh, Linux kernel, so you can uh, hack many, many things. So this, these are the, the market shares for Android phones, uh, iPhones, Blackberries. So you see now uh, Android uh, is becoming the, the second largest uh, market share in the US. Well, no, let's, let's talk uh, about the geolocation because it's, this is far more interesting than a little introduction. So uh, to geolocate uh, a phone, you have different, uh, different ways to do that. Okay? You can use the, the integrated GPS you have on most phones. Okay? The GPS is very accurate. You can have uh, a, a three or four meter precision with the, the GPS. Uh, but the problem is that you need uh, a GPS in your phone. This is not the case for all phones uh, nowadays. Okay? And uh, the user must switch it on. Okay, uh, it's not enabled by, by default because uh, of the the battery consumption, right? And another problem with the GPS is if it's that doesn't work inside the buildings because you don't have the, the satellite view, uh, nor underground, for example, in the in the subways. Okay, so you can't locate yourself uh, in the subways or in the buildings. So that's. Uh, a problem. Another way to geolocate uh, yourself is to use Wi-Fi. Okay, Wi-Fi, uh, on the contrary, works inside buildings, so uh, you, you, you can't uh, you, you, you can locate yourself uh, at work or at home. No problem with that. But you need uh, Wi-Fi on your phone. You need to switch it on. And it's far uh, less accurate than uh, GPS uh, because the, uh, the coverage for a, a Wi-Fi uh, access point is about 300 meters. Okay, so uh, it's it's not very uh, very accurate. Okay, and you need, of course, you need uh, access points uh, in order to uh, triangulate your position. Okay, if you don't have any uh, access point near your building, uh, you won't be able to. Uh, locate yourself, right? So these are the, the, the two uh, classical ways to uh, to locate yourself. 
The last uh, way, and the most interesting way, is uh, the GSM location, right? So here you don't need a Wi-Fi or GPS. Uh, so it, it will work with all uh, GSM phones, okay? And it can be done from the network side. You don't have uh, necessarily to install an application on your phone to have a smartphone, okay? Uh, with a very old phone, uh, you are uh, able to uh, geolocate yourself because this is, uh, this is made from the network side, okay? And not from the user side. The disadvantages are you uh, have a, a, very, uh, a very low accuracy, okay? Um, GSM cells uh, can, um, can extend to uh, nearly, I think, 30 kilometers. So uh, in, in cities, in big cities, there is no problem because there are lots of uh, uh, BTS, uh, that is to say uh, GSM access points. So in the cities, you have uh, a quite good accuracy, uh, which can be uh, a 100 meter. But when you are far from the city, for example, in the, in the seaside, uh, you won't be uh, able to geolocate precisely, okay? And of course, you need uh, GSM coverage, but uh, it's easier to have uh, GSM coverage than to have uh, Wi-Fi coverage. So how does it work? How can you locate yourself using GSM? Uh, you have to know that uh, every uh, GSM cell, every BTS, uh, which means uh, base transceiver station, is identified by actually four numbers. Okay. First number is MCC. MCC uh, stands for Mobile Country Code. This is uh, the, the country code you are in. Okay. So th these are uh, normalized codes. Uh, which are not the prefix uh, you, you dial on your phone. That's, this, these are other codes. Okay. For instance, uh, in, uh, in Germany, it's uh, 262. Right. Second number is MNC. MNC stands for Mobile Network Code, and uh, this is uh, a code for the operator, for the network operator. Right. For uh, T-Mobile Deutschland, for instance, uh, the, the code is one, okay? Because this is the first uh, network operator in Germany. Third number is um, a code about the area you are in, okay? So cells are grouped uh, into areas. Uh, and uh, usually uh, big cities are uh, divided in five, six, seven uh, large areas which can be more for, for some cities. And uh, in, a, in an area, you have different cells. So the last number is the cell ID, uh, which is the code for the ID in uh, the area, right? So with these four numbers, you are able to uh, know in which cell precisely you are. Right. So uh, this is not new. So uh, there have been several attempts to build databases of GSM cells because it's not uh, it's not easy to have a clear uh, a clear mapping between those four codes and, uh, for example, GPS position. Okay. Uh, the the cells are um, are. Um, are attributed by, by network operators, but they, they keep the database for themselves. So the, 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 the cell positions are not public, right? So there have been attempts to uh, build database of all cells in many, many countries, in many uh, operator networks, right? So you have, a, for example, location at API.com, uh, which have nearly uh, 11 million cells in the database in more than 200 countries, right? So you can find all, the, all those uh, databases in, in Wikipedia, right? So this is a first try. 
to uh, geolocate yourself using only cell IDs. But why not use something more efficient like Google indexing power? Okay? Instead of indexing yourself cells, okay, which uh, means uh, a lot of effort, okay, uh, a lot of uh, human task, human power, uh, why not use something completely automatic, which is uh, regularly updated, uh, like the Google indexing power, right? So how does, how does it work? It works using uh, Google Cars. I'm pretty sure you have already heard about Google Cars. These are the cars uh, that, um, that build the, the Google Street View, okay? That takes pictures of all streets, okay? The Google Cars uh, not only uh, take pictures of, of streets, house, and uh, uh, all the surroundings, but also index all uh, Wi-Fi access points and all GSM, BTS, okay? So they have uh, a pretty uh, complete database of uh, GSM cells, okay? They keep it secret, but they have it, right? And they have not only the Google cars, they have all Android users also. Because your Android phone is uh, constantly updating this database when uh, you uh, use, for, for example, Google Maps, okay? So all, uh, all um, Android users are uh, updating this very large uh, Google database. So this is continuously ad updated and quite good quality. But is there a Google API somewhere? Okay. Yes, but it's quite confidential. Quite confidential. Um, there is a Google API. To, in order to be sure there is a Google API, try to uh, run a Google map uh, with the GPS and the Wi-Fi disabled. Okay. So your phone will only be able to geolocate using GSM. Right. So. I have tried this, and I have seen there is some kind of API the phone uses to uh, be able to geolocate, right? Another uh, entry point to the API is when you uh, install a Google Geese plugin. It's not, much, not so much known, but it's a plugin for Firefox and uh, Chromey, um, which allows, uh, for example, uh, cache browsing or uh, uh, local search. I mean, when you type restaurant in Google, uh, it finds the, the pizzeria just in front of your building. So Google is, is able to know where you are, okay? Just by sniffing the, the query from the, the Google Gears, you are able to uh, figure that there is an API, right? But this API, of course, when you are uh, running uh, a local search, doesn't use GSM because you don't have a GSM receiver in, in your desktop computer. So it's only using Wi-Fi access point, right? So first of all, let's talk about Android Google Maps internals, right? So uh, I have compiled a, a TCP dump for uh, my uh, Android phone, which is a Nexus one. Uh, so you need uh, to cross-compile TCP dump for ARM architecture, because of course the, the phone doesn't uh, run uh, an Intel processor, right? And uh, I noticed there, uh, there were some exchanges in a binary. So this is a proprietary binary protocol, right? But it uses uh, HTTP and HTTP POST to this URL here, right? GLM, MMAP. 
Some people have uh, figured it out also. So you can, uh, you can look at this, uh, this excellent uh, blog, this excellent blog page, which is called the, the Poor Man GPS. And some people managed to uh, successfully uh, reverse engineer this binary protocol. So in fact, you uh, just have to pack uh, the, different, the four different uh, codes we talked about, so the MCC, MNC, LAC, and CID. You have just to pack them in the, the proper format and send them in binary to the uh, google.com server, right? And you have an answer also in binary, but it's quite buggy. Okay, I mean, when you uh, when you look when you basically do uh, twice the query, you don't uh, have the same answer sometimes. So it's quite quite bizarre. Have a look now at Google Gears. Uh, sniffing Firefox plugin, okay? And now uh, it's a lot easier because it's simple JSON, right? So it's plain text. You don't have to reverse engineer uh, many, many things. The only problem is that it only uh, uses uh, Wi-Fi and basically no GSM, right? And you have a, a quite confidential page uh, which talk about uh, uh, Google Gear's API on, on the, the google.com website. Uh, officially, it's deprecated in the page, okay? But it's, it works very well. It's not buggy at all. It works very well. It's easy to use, easy to understand, and it's regularly updated, okay? Have a look at the query and uh, the response. So you see it's uh, a simple post HTTP query. And you just have uh, to, um, to format uh, a, a correct JSON request with the, the four codes we talked about. That is to say the MCC here. So 208 stands for France, right? The mobile network code, this is the first network operator in France, which is uh, orange. The location array code, which is the code for the area here, and the cell ID. So this is the query. Have a look at the answer now. And in the answer, you have interesting details. Not only you have the latitude and longitude, which is Pretty, pretty nice. You have a full uh, human readable address, including street number, street name, zip code, city, region, and country. So you have uh, a, compre a complete uh, reverse geolocation on, uh, using only the, the, the cell IDs, right? And uh, uh, you have even the accuracy which I think is the, the cell coverage. It, it couldn't be anything else. So uh, it, it should be the, the cell coverage, in fact. So here you see the, the accuracy is not so good, 500 meters. And we can go further uh, by mapping the entire uh, GSM network in uh, a given uh, area, right? Using sniffing, because uh, every single BTS broadcasts uh, its, uh, its uh, cell ID, its location area code. So if you sniff the GSM network, and there have been a talk about uh, GSM sniffing, if you sniff the GSM network, you are able to collect all uh, uh, LAC and CIDs from your area, right? You can do that using a SDR, which is a software-defined radio. So here you have uh, one well-known SDR, which is the USRP1 from Etus Research, okay? 
quite expensive, but it's a, a very good toy. If you want something uh, cheaper, you can buy a, a simple Nokia. Okay, this, this is a very old uh, Nokia version. You can find it for uh, nearly 15 euros on eBay. Okay, so buy it. It's a, it's a very good hacking toy. And you will be able uh, to uh, sniff the broadcast from the BTS. So, in order to achieve that, I used uh, the AirPro project, which is a project for GSM sniffing. Okay? So, first of all, you have to scan the frequency to find all the, the different BTS with GNU Radio. Okay? When you have identified the, the, the good frequencies, you have to demodulate the signal with AirProbe. And when you have the, the demodulated signal, you have to decode it with Wireshark. Right? So three simple steps. And here is uh, the result from the, the demodulated capture. So T-Shark is uh, basically Wireshark in, uh, in console mode. Okay? So this is uh, a clear version of uh, Wireshark. I, uh, I take the decoded capture as an XML file here, and I just apply uh, a filter in order to uh, only uh, keep the, the packets with cell IDs, right? And here in the, in the capture, you see you have four different uh, BTS broadcasts with MCC, MNC, LAC, and CID. And I was able to map uh, nearly one square kilometer of Paris from my bed without moving from my home, <laughs> just by using the, the, the URSRP and listening to broadcast. Okay, so, so this was the introduction about the geolocation with BTS. Now let's see how we can attack an Android phone. So Android uses um, a specific logging facility, which is quite unknown. And it's unfortunately enabled by default. Okay. Android has three or four different logs. It depends on the Android phone you have. Okay. These logs are not a uh, plain text file, like log in, uh, in Unix or in Linux. Okay? These logs are, in fact, circular memory buffers. Right? So it means they, are, uh, they have a, a very uh, limited size, and they will, uh, uh, they, they, will, uh, uh, they will be truncated after the, this given size, and they will start over and again. Right? These logs files are actually handled by character device files, like character device uh, drivers in uh, Linux, right? So character device uh, dri drivers are not easy uh, to, to handle. So uh, there is a built-in uh, tool in, the, in every uh, single Android phone, uh, which uh, will help us fortunately, to, uh, uh, to manage these logs and to read these logs. Uh, the tool is the logcat, the logcat tool. Have a look at the logs. So the, the logs are character device in slash dev slash log. Okay? But these are no uh, text file. Okay? These are uh, character device. So you cannot directly read those files. So you see here uh, four logs, the system log, the radio log, the main log, and the events log, right? And here you see the, the C, 
which stands for character device, right? You can notice something strange, okay, about the permissions. Carefully look, look at the permission of the log files, right? You will see uh, other as the right permission on those logs, okay? This will be important in the next steps. Now with the log cat utility, you can have a look at the log size, okay, using uh, log cat minus b. This is to select a given log, okay, and minus g is to uh, to query uh, the the character device for its size, okay. So you see most uh, most logs have 64 kilobytes data, right? Have a look now at the contents of the log files, okay? So if we try to read them as a standard log files, uh, we, will, we will see that, in fact, they uh, are in binary, okay? So you have, you have text in, in them, but uh, you have uh, binary fields, you see, on the very first line, for example. So uh, what, what, what does it stand for? In fact, some data are uh, binary encoded, like, for example, uh, the, the timestamp for the events uh, in the log files. So these are for the timestamps or the, the, um, the PID of the program that uh, issues the, the lines, right? Now have a look at the radio log, which is probably the, the most interesting log on Android phones. So uh, issuing a log cat uh, with the radio log in, uh, in the verbose mode, so in order to show the time, uh, minus v. And uh, minus s is to set a filter on the log in order to have only the uh, log files uh, from the uh, RILG uh, daemon, which is uh, the, the daemon that handles the uh, GSM uh, chip on Android phone, right? So what can we find here? We can find lines with the operator keyword, and at the end of the line, you have the MCC and MNC of the operator, right here. And in other lines, with the keyword registration states, you have uh, the, uh, the LAC, this, which, which is, which is the, the location area code, so in, which, in what area you are, and the cell ID which are eggs encoded, right? So here you see you have uh, two different cells because the cell ID is different. There is a small difference in the, in the cell ID, you see? And you have the corresponding time in the logs. So that means you have a complete history of uh, your trip during the day in your Android phone, right? So the attack scenario will be to collect this history of visited uh, GSM cells on the victim size, because you need access to the, the victim phone in order to do that. But you, uh, you don't need any uh, prior access. I mean, if you have access at a, at a time, you will be able to read the, the history, so you will be able to see where was the victim one hour, two, two hours, three hours before, okay? So this is an history, so you don't have, uh, you don't need a prior access. Then you need to send this history to yourself, or send them to the attacker, and you have to resolve them into latitude and longitude. Of course, in order to know to draw on a map where was the victim, because cell IDs uh, 
are not uh, of any help to, to know where, where, where's the victim. So how can we do that? In fact, there are two ways, two principal ways to do that. You can do that locally. Uh, here, this will mean uh, you have physical access to the victim phone, right? So this can be uh, your friend phone on the table. This can be your kid phone, your spouse phone, for instance. So if you have physical access, no problem, okay? We will see that uh, in a few slides. Or you can do that remotely, but remote here uh, doesn't mean uh, we will use a remote vulnerability. Uh, in fact, we will uh, better use a local vulnerability uh, and a bit of social engineering, or not. It depends. So how does physical attack work? You just have to connect the victim's phones to the attacker computer via USB. So if you have access uh, to a phone, just for a few seconds, you take it and you plug the USB cable and you dump the lock cat, the radio lock cat. Okay? This takes only three or four seconds. This is very, very quick. Okay? And it even works if the victim's phone is locked thanks to the USB debugging function you have on Android, right? So this, this was the, the physical attack. Now let's talk about the, the most interesting uh, attack range, the remote attack. Uh, this will allow you to remotely spy the victim Uh, using a malware, so you need a, a local access to, to the phone. So the best way to do that is to uh, install a malware on the phone, who, uh, which will abuse either uh, the, the trust of the user, okay, or the Android security model, because there are flaws in this security model. So this will uh, require a bit of social engineering, or some flows. How does uh, security work with Android? Okay, Android, uh, you, you probably have uh, downloaded an application on the Android market. When you download an application, uh, the market asks you uh, if you want to install this application and will list all the permissions needed for this application. So theoretically, an application uh, cannot use a permission uh, which is not declared in uh, its manifest file. Okay, so this is uh, a fine-grained uh, permission uh, model, which is far more uh, secure than uh, the, the, the iPhone application. Okay, and for for this, uh, in order to to ensure that the application doesn't use uh, any other permission, you have a Java sandbox, because uh, Android applications are, are in Java, or uh, a subset of Java, which is called uh, Dalvik, in fact. So permissions are uh, listed in the Android.permission package on Android. So you have a, a bunch of permissions in Android security model. And what can a user fear uh, if uh, he don't want to be uh, located? If you don't want to be located, you will carefully look at permissions for uh, location, like access find location, which uh, use the GPS, for example, or access course location, which use Wi-Fi or GSM network. So if you don't want uh, to be located, you will uh, carefully look at those four permissions, those two permissions, sorry. And um, probably you, uh, you won't uh, authorize applications which uh, use the internet access, okay? Because with the internet access, the application will be able to report your location, okay? So you will uh, carefully block 
the application uh, which use both permission. This, this is a, a big danger. So first attack is using both permissions. Okay. Uh, most users, in fact, won't care. Okay. Most users don't don't look at permissions and uh, will install a game uh, which use the location permission and the internet permission, even if the game uh, isn't related to internet or to location at all. Okay. I mean, most users don't care. Okay. Um, why? Because uh, internet permission is um, is quite used in, uh, in Android application because it's needed for a free ad sponsored application. For the ad in the game, uh, you need internet permission, right? And geolocation permission is needed for location aware application. Like when you do a local search in Google for a restaurant, for example, you need uh, the location permission. Okay, so most users won't care. So this is the first naive attack. Second attack is much more sophisticated and it's based on radio logs. Okay, instead of using Android Geolocation API, you uh, only read radio logs, so you don't need the, the location permission, any location permission, you just need the read logs permission. Okay? So you are able to uh, read and parse the radio log and to collect the different LAC and CIDs from the logs. Second part of the attack is to write those results in the system log, okay, which is another, another log. And you don't need any permission to write to system logs because this is used for debugging. Okay, so you can write anything in the system logs. You don't have to uh, declare any permission to write the system log. Third step is to voluntarily crash the application, for example, using a null pointer exception or that kind of things. Okay, and you don't need any permission to raise an exception. Okay. Fourth step. Uh, is the crash reporting step. Okay? When an application crash, you have a, a feedback client on your Android phone which uh, sends the developer the system logs at the time the application crash. So you don't need any internet access to remotely connect, collect the cell IDs. You use the integrated Google feedback client. Right? So th this is the, the principle for uh, reporting bugs, okay? You have an angry user which finds a bug, who reports the bug to the developer, and the developer fixed the app, and the user is happy. So this can be abused, okay? Here is a, a voluntary crash in the application. So for example, a, a null pointer exception. So the application crash, and you have the choice to, to force close the application, okay, or to report the crash. And when you click on report the crash, the system logs will be sent to Google, and uh, Google privacy uh, condition explains that they share the system logs with the developer in order to fix the program, and the developer in its developer console will be able to see all user reports uh, by, uh, by exception uh, types, okay? So here you have out of memory errors or null pointer exceptions and all the reports. So this is second attack. Third attack, is even stronger because you don't need any permission. You just use the Android NDK. Android NDK is the native development kit for Android. And NDK allows developers to completely bypass permissions model because you are able to call native code from 
your Android application. That is to say, you are able to uh, execute C or C++ code directly in your Java application. And uh, of course, this C or C++ code does not run in the sandbox. So you are able to uh, read any file on the phone, to write to any file on the phone, to execute any code, and to have network access without any permission needed. And force attack uh, is the last min minute uh, ID. So if you have any feedback about th this attack, I will be very happy. Okay. Force attack is a man in the middle attack during application download over Wi-Fi. Okay. Since uh, Android 2.1, you have a new system uh, uh, for um, downloading applications from the market. Okay. Uh, you have a download manager, an integrated download manager, and this integrated download manager works in uh, plain text HTTP to download the application. Not only to download the application, but to uh, see uh, the, the application name, application description, and application permissions just before uh, downloading the application. So by doing active man in the middle, you are able to change application description. You are able to change application permission, which will be shown on the phone. And you are even able to replace the application content by another content, which can be a malware, for instance. So when the user uh, downloads uh, a game, for, for instance, uh, he will, in fact, download another program, which can be a malware, without noticing it. Because the, the Android Download Manager only checks for uh, a digital signature, which means the applications come from the Android market, but you can replace an application by another. And uh, the user won't notice anything because the application is signed. So this is uh, the, the query used uh, to download an application uh, in the Android market. So you notice it's simple HTTP in plain text. So no problem to uh, do uh, active man in the middle. So that was the biggest part. But we can uh, do more than uh, geolocate users. OK? There are much more interesting information in the different logs. Because here uh, we have seen what was in the radio logs. But you have actually other information you can, you can find on, in radio logs or in other logs. OK? You have all phone calls, okay? numbers and duration of phone calls. And you have even all SMS messages. All contents of SMS are in logs. Okay, They are just uh, encoded in a well-known format, which is the PDU format. So you just have to decode uh, the, the SMS. But the actual content of the SMS is in the logs. Okay, So you have the, the, the sender, the recipients, the dates, the time, and the content of the SMS. So you, have, you are able not only to geolocate the user, but to collect all phone calls and all SMS messages from the targeted phone. So you are able to figure out now uh, where did uh, phone calls take place, uh, where the SMS were received or sent, and you are even able to recover deleted SMS or deleted call history directly from the logs. So what's the, the history length? How much time uh, you can recover by reading the logs? Uh, this is actually a, a good question, a difficult question, because it, it will depend on log filling. I mean, if the user uh, has moved quite quickly for the last hours, or has, has uh, sent uh, several text messages, for example, or has issued several phone calls, the log will fill very quickly. So you will be able to recover only, only a few hours of activity. But if the user hasn't 
traveled a lot, hasn't found a lot, you will be able to recover the activity for a whole day. Okay? But remember, with the logcat uh, tool, you can change the log size, and you can, in a malware, uh, you can multiply the log size by 10 or by 100 in order to be able to uh, gather uh, user activity for a month or for two months. So now you have complete geolocation calls and SMS history tracking with nearly or no permission needed. How to project yourself now? Don't now. Don't buy an iPhone. I mean, uh, Android security model is, is quite strong because for each application you have a different user ID and group ID, which you don't have on iPhone. Okay, iPhone applications share, share the same uh, rights. Uh, you don't you don't have uh, so much fine grained uh, permission uh, model in in iPhone. Okay. Uh, and you don't have uh, hidden or forbidden API on Android. I mean, Apple uh, can uh, can forbid uh, API usage. This is not the, the case on Android. So the security model is much more uh, much more stronger uh, in Andro in Android phone. So don't buy an iPhone. Okay. <laughs> a, a few recommendations. Uh, first of all, carefully look at applications that use the NDK. Okay. Uh, does anybody in the room care about that? <laughs> it's nearly impossible to see because you have to uh, download the APK archive file and uh, extract it in order to see if there are dot so files in it. Okay. Uh, you can't do that uh, from the phone uh, before uh, downloading the application. So this is actually uh, a hard, uh, hard part, right? Be careful also uh, not to install any application requiring read logs permission, because we have seen that uh, this allows the developer to uh, recover your entire uh, location calls SMS activity. So don't install any application requiring read logs permission. Don't submit bug reports, <laughs> or at least, at least uh, disable the uh, submission for system logs, because you have the choice. By default, system logs are sent during bug reports, OK, using the Google feedback client. But Carefully have a look at the Google Feedback Client and uncheck the box uh, uh, which uh, sends the system logs. So you will be safe. You can reduce the logcat buffer size for your privacy. Okay, so this this is a bit tricky and a, a bit a bit buggy, but you can try uh, logcat minus r and logcat minus n to play with the log size and um, the, the buffer numbers, right? You can uh, clear your logcat regularly. So this is very easy. And you don't need any permission to do that. So even with a non-rooted phone, you can clear your logcat, for example, in a, in a cron task or using a dedicated application. So this can be done with logcat minus c, or you can uh, disable radio logs, but it's uh, a bit tricky, and you probably need root access to do that and to uh, patch uh, the startup script uh, of your phone. So this is a bit hard. Have a look at a small demo now. So th this was very hard to do, to act, to do an actual uh, a scenario here because uh, I didn't travel uh, a lot uh, this day. <laughs> I stay here. 
So this is not very interesting. Uh, so uh, I will uh, show you just how to actually Okay, the, the virtual machine crashed, so this, <laughs> this is not a, a, good, uh, a good case. But what does the, the tool? I will release a Python tool uh, after the event that um, actually dumps the logcat when you connect your phone via USB, dumps the logcat, uh, collects the different cell IDs, and uh, resolve the cell IDs in latitude and longitude and builds a Google map with all the different positions in the day, okay, with their associated dates and time. So you see here, uh, this, was in a, this was last August, uh, I went back to home after, after work, so my work is nearly here. Uh, you see, I've left the work at uh, 20 past 6, and I arrive uh, at home nearly uh, 14 minutes after, but I stay at home uh, up to uh, 11 p.m. Okay? So you have here nearly five hours of history in the phone. But I travel quite a lot because I, I cross nearly all, uh, all Paris in order to, to go back home. So I, I will release the, the Python tool uh, to, in order to, to do that, to automatically do that from any Android uh, phone. This will be on uh, Google Code, right? <laughs> After the event. <laughs> so that's all, folks. Hope you enjoyed the talk. Many thanks for attending. If you have any questions, feel free to, to ask them. All right. Uh, thanks very much for the great talk. Uh, time for questions. Um, hi, I was wondering if you have had experience running um, your Nexus One or any Android phone uh, with disabling the logging features of the radio or turning the log cat to your, the radio device file to zero and seeing if there's any problems or issues with the Android system while you do that. When, so, it, sorry, uh, can, you, can you repeat a little it, bit more slowly? If you, if you reduce the log size yeah. of the radio uh, device file to zero, uh, I was wondering if you have tried this on your Nexus One or any Android phone and noticed any problems. I, I, um, actually, I never tried uh, to reduce to zero the log file, um, but uh, it won't uh, it won't raise any issue. I mean, the, the radio logs are, are never read, so this is not a problem if you reduce the log file at the minimum size. I don't know what is the minimum size actually, but this won't be an issue, and this is recommended for privacy. All right, more questions? Uh, fr one question, two questions from the interwebs. Yes, so the, uh, the chat room wanted to know um, since which version of Android included error log reporting? Which version of Android are yeah. vulnerable? All, all versions since uh, 1.6 at least, but probably 1.5. Okay, and then the other question was um, from, and that was that question was from Nuremberg. The other question was from down in the Hack Center, and somebody said um, that they just checked on two Android phones, and there was only MCC and MNC in the log. Could it be that the information recording the cell ID is only acquired and logged if use wireless networks is activated in the my location settings? Uh, perhaps they have not enabled um, the geolocation by network in their settings. 
because you have an option to use uh, uh, Google Maps even if you don't have uh, any GPS or Wi-Fi. So there is uh, an option uh, which is called, I think, uh, use, uh, network, uh, use network location or something like that. Perhaps it's not enabled. All right, uh, more questions from the audience uh, in the back? Hi, I tried the lock cut on this X10 Sony Ericsson phone and it doesn't have read access, so probably it's not working for all the phones. Uh, he said every phone is possible. With root access, of course, I can lock all things, but normal users doesn't have read access on all the locks he mentioned. What, what did you actually try to do? Uh, I used a terminal application, yeah. which is quite similar to the debug mode, and typed lockcat and says permission denied. No read access for other users. Yeah. R -W -R -W yeah that, that's that's w. normal, because the, the terminal application as in uh, the, the read log permission, so you cannot read the logs from the terminal application. Okay, you, you so need in to debug read the log. mode you have more rights. Sorry? In debug mode I would have more rights. You mean? I, I didn't catch, sorry. Okay. Would he have the permission in debug mode? In debug mode, no, no, no. It depends on the, the application, the terminal application doesn't have the, the read logs permission, so you cannot read the log unless you are a uh, root. Okay, when you use a, a rooted phone, you will be able to read the logs with the terminal application. Yeah. Or you can read the log uh, from uh, an application which have the read logs permission, or from NDK, from a, a native application which use a, a NDK, okay. right? Other questions? Um, yeah, you said that NDK does not use the rights management. So if, yeah. Yeah, if I download any app from the, from the market, can it be that it has more rights than actually listed on the rights list because it uses NDK internals? NDK enabled applications uh, will have more rights, which doesn't mean they will have all rights because uh, they will uh, be limited to uh, Linux permissions then. Okay, but it means that uh, not every write needs to be listed in the writes list when it uses uh, NDK. Sorry? So, um, well, if a normal Dalvik app um, yeah, it lists every, every, every write that is requested, for example, GPS um, location, uh, write to read GPS location. But you do, if you do it over NDK as an app developer, uh, this, this right doesn't show up in the list. Is, is it correct? Yeah, if, if you use uh, um, any uh, native API, uh, this will not be listed in, uh, in permission used by the application. Okay, and do any market apps use native API? Sorry? <laughs> do any apps listed in the market use this API, this oh, native API? Of course, yes. You have uh, several uh, video players which for performance reasons use NDK for uh, video decompression, for instance. Okay, so you. Uh, if, if you have a look at, for example, vPlayer, which is a, a really nice uh, Android video player, it will use NDK for, for video decompression to, to read uh, DivX files or AV files. Okay, there's another question. Uh, hi, so is there any way to tell when I install an app from the market, if it uses the NDK, uh, NDK compile code, is, is there any way to, to see it from a user standpoint? Unfortunately, uh, you cannot see it from the market. So you have to download the APK archive and uh, extract it in order to see if there are any .so files inside. But there are no way on the, on the phone, in the market application, to see that you will have to use a file manager to extract the APK and see if there are .so files. Okay, one last question. Hi. 
Um, it's actually not true that using the NDK um, bypasses all permission checks because permission checks are not done at the Dalvik layer. For example, the terminal app is native code and that guy didn't get the automatic power to read logs. It's um, permission checks happen at the IPC boundary, not at the Dalvik boundary. Dalvik is not intended to poo. Um, Dalvik is not intended to be any security boundary. Um, it happens elsewhere at the IPC boundary. Whenever like you cross the process boundary by making a call across binder, for example. So um, if you can bypass any or all permission checks merely by using native code, that would be a huge bug and you should report it to Google. But I don't think it will turn out to be true. Okay, good, good remark, but uh, using NDK doesn't allow you to do anything. You are limited to a Linux permission. I mean, if your application is not in the, in the right group, for example, to read the log file, you won't be able to read the log file from the native application, okay? But you will be able, for, for example, to open a socket, because opening a socket doesn't uh, need any, uh, any permission at the system uh, level. Actually, there's a special blob in the Linux kernel that uh, blocks your access to the socket API unless you have the permission, the internet permission. I, I haven't seen this. And I was able to, uh, to do network uh, requests without any special rights. You, have you written a, t a test app to do that? Yeah. And it works? Yeah. That's a bug. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So it seems we end on having discovered an Android bug, possibly. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, let's uh, thank the speaker again for this great talk. And just, um, just a word, if, uh, if somebody uh, managed to, um, uh, to uh, attack um, an application download using active uh, man in the middle, please mail me. It will be very interesting, but I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, you, you can do that. Okay, unfortunately we have to stop at this point.